morning, everyone. My name's Graham Taylor. For those of you, many of you probably don't know me, Mary and I, my wife over there, we run an agricultural contracting business over in Whitemans Valley, Mangaroa, where we basically grow grass and put it into bales to feed horses and sheep and cattle and humans. If they really want it, they could buy it. That's fine, but <laughs> that's uh, most of our time. And when uh, Laurie said, could I speak in some day in January? I said, can you give me a wet one? Because we don't normally uh, get to church if it's sunny. <laughs> so we said, all right, let's go for January the 21st, and we'll hope that's been rain before so that we won't be busy. And sure enough, yesterday was soaking wet, so we've got no grass on the ground, no need to be on tractors today, and I can be here. I came across this prayer some years ago by, I think it's by an Anglican priest from Christchurch. I'm not even sure that he's still alive. But I really liked it because it sums up a lot of about how we turn up to church on a Sunday morning. And he encapsulates it really well, I thought. Our week has been a bit ups and down. We've had lovely neighbours for, what, 17 years? And this week we helped them move up to Waikanae, so it's a grieving process in losing neighbours who are so such special people. They've been so wonderful to us and really nice. And then about two days ago we got notice that for a good friend of ours, she's only 68, cardiac arrest, and uh, this morning's email says that short of a miracle she may not pull through. She's not old. 68's not old, is it? It's younger than me. <laughs> And then I got here this morning, I got all the equipment out and set it all up and then uh, there was one little bag that had a connector and this and a few other things and I couldn't find it. And I rang Mary and I said, it's got to be in the office, it's not in my bag, I put it in the bag. I was sure it was in the bag and I was panicking around. Turns out I'd put that little pouch band on the back seat there. <laughs> but. All of those things tend to, you bring into church with you when you come, whatever's happened in the week. And I like what this guy says. We have rushed in here this morning full of preparations, dressing for the day, because I'm not, I don't wear this when I'm working, recovering from the week, thinking about tomorrow. We're saturated with activity. If we stop, we'll fall asleep. For beneath the surface, we are wooden with weariness, dead from demand, dull from expectation, and we are still counting the minutes until we can get on with the rush and ignore the ache and block out the heartfelt twinge. For we thrive on burying our burdens, denying our doubts, hiding our regrets, and ignoring the still small voice that calls us to rest. Father, calm our frenetic activity. In this hour, pause us with your peace, Soften our hard drive for success and massage our nerves with your soft, quiet praise. Let your voice, O God, sing soul into our aching hearts. Remind us of our forgotten dreams. Whisper love into our cold bones. For one hour of you would be enough to revive our world. He captures it so well of how often we come into church, we bring all the stuff that's part of the week prior and that last line for one hour would be enough to revive our world and surely our world needs that right now let's pray father as we look into your word this morning i pray that we will hear what you are saying to your people that each of us will take from it the message that you want for individuals here not just for everyone but for each person listening and taking part I pray that there will be a specific message for them, each one. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your goodness to us, for your provision in so many ways. And we pray that this time will be a time when we can honour your word and learn further from it and draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me start by telling a, a story. Once upon a time, in a land far away, there lived a kind and a generous old man. 
Now, when I say that little thing there, what have I told you so far? What are the things you know? There's an old man. Where does he live? In a land far away. What sort of a person is he? Kind, and he's gentle. Yeah. Somewhere in your minds, you've all got a picture of that man by now. I've told you very little about it, but you've got a picture in your mind as that story starts to unfold. My attention always is grabbed when somebody starts to tell a story. I always think, oh, where's the story going? Where's it going to end? What's the catch? What's the, what's the plot? Where are we going with this story? And often, there's the gentle old man. <laughs> often in other cultures, particularly in Papua New Guinea, where I worked for many years, the people there just love to sit down and tell stories. And in their language, it says, time belongs sin down the story. And I worked up there for, well, with our family for many years, from 1990 to 95, and from 2010 to 2013, I was back up there working on a project. And there are many, many times when the locals would say, time belongs sin down the story, and you would just sit down and tell stories. That's all it was. There was no necessarily a point to it. The thing was you sit down and you told stories. And the men would tell, my grandfather told me this about this and this and this, and he'd tell a story and somebody would tell a story. That's how history is kept. We've lost a lot of that in our Western culture. We don't tell stories the way people do in indigenous cultures in places like Papua New Guinea. But I spent many hours listening to stories and telling stories, and people just love doing that. Well, here we have a short story from Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. That's the end of the story. Short story. <laughs> Jesus told that story. It was a parable, one of many parables that Jesus used to share with people the truth that he was trying to get through. But what is a parable? Well, it's a short story. Well, that one was pretty short about the man finding treasure, wasn't it? Used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. Or it's also an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So a story is told about everyday events, but its deeper meaning is something much bigger than just the little things. And it's interesting that you were talking before, Leslie, about God is interested and involved in the little things of our daily life. Jesus told parables about little things, ordinary things. So why did Jesus speak in parables? Surely he could have just outlined what he wanted his listeners to hear. So, okay, people, everyone quiet. Sit down in your rows, please, and listen to me, and I'll tell you what you have to believe. Right, number one, you have to believe this. You have to do this. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. He could have done that, couldn't he? But he didn't teach that way. Most often, Jesus told a story like that. If Jesus had just told everyone what they had to do, what they couldn't do, shouldn't do, should do, it would be simple. There would be no misunderstanding, no interpretation of it. It's just, oh, Jesus said so, we've got to do it. But Jesus didn't teach that way. That Jesus spoke in parables because they were easy to understand. Some of the truths that Jesus was sharing were actually very complex and very deep. He was trying to get very deep spiritual concepts through to people who were ordinary, average people like you and me. So he broke that story, broke that concept down into parables or stories. Those parables deal with farming, bread making, runaway sons, lost items, everyday things, ordinary, small, everyday things. Jesus told parables about those. A child could grasp the basic story. Of course, the spiritual leaders of the time, they didn't like that. They were looking for, oh, 
much deeper things, much more profound. They weren't worried about stories about a lost coin or a lost son or a mustard seed. They were bound up in laws and rules and how can we make sure people obey and do what they're told to do. In Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9, we read that people will be hearing but never understanding, ever seeing but never perceiving. And Jesus actually quoted that in Matthew chapter 13, around the time when he was talking us through these parables, he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you but not to them referring to the Pharisees, the spiritual ones, the ones who were lording it over the rest, ordinary people, we are the spiritual leaders. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. Unless we hear with our ears, and see with our eyes, and understand with our hearts... We won't be healed and we can't enter the kingdom of God. Jesus knew that most of his listeners would need a deeper level of thinking to grasp what it meant to be part of the kingdom of God. If there was only a casual interest shown in what Jesus said, that didn't lead people wouldn't dig in and go to the truth. Only a heartfelt desire to dig in and discover what is the truth. What's this man saying? Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me. When? When you seek me with all your heart. It's not a casual thing that we just, oh, who is this God? Who is Jesus? It's not a casual, oh, I'll check it out. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Another reason Jesus spoke in parables is that the stories are easy to remember. There's a basic three-step flow to the parables. There's a beginning, a challenge or a problem, and a resolution. One, two, three. Anyone can understand the story. Anyone can repeat that story. You could probably repeat the story already that I put up before about the treasure in a field. The man found treasure in a field, went away, sold everything he had, bought the field, and got the treasure. Stories, it's remembered. It's, you can transfer it to other people. Another reason Jesus spoke in parables is that Jesus often wanted to confront, sometimes even shock his listeners. Fancy a son coming to a father and saying, Dad, I can't wait till you're dead. Give me my inheritance now. In the culture of that time in Israel, if a son came to a father and said, I can't wait till you're dead. Give me my inheritance now. I want to spend the money that son would be, the people listening to that parable of the prodigal son would be going, that doesn't happen, that's that's wrong. And so it confronts them, it gets them thinking, well, what's this about? And then later in the parable, when the father sees this wayward son coming home, the father lifts up his robes, it says, lifts up his robes and runs towards the son. In that culture, and those people knew, listening to Jesus, if a man lifted his robes and ran, that would be so shameful. A man never showed his legs. An old, old man, a father, would never run like that. Walk gracefully, maybe, but definitely not towards a wayward son. So those things in the story, they hit the people and go, oh, that doesn't fit with our culture. We don't understand it. What's going on in this story? So Jesus uses those stories to confront people. Fourth reason that Jesus spoke in parables was that he wanted his listeners to think through what they were hearing. These stories are not just nice stories to listen to. They have a deeper meaning, and Jesus wanted people to think it through. And I often imagine people walking away. You know, we read of thousands of people spending the day with Jesus, listening to him teach, and then they'd be walking home. Bare feet maybe, I don't know, Roman sandals dusty feet, walking with their brother, their mother, whatever, 
They'd be talking, what do you think he was on about talking about treasure in a field? What was that story that he was telling about a mustard seed? Why did he tell us about a, a silly son that ran away and wasted all his father? They would be thinking and talking amongst themselves afterwards, trying to work it out. And that's why Jesus used parables. One of the reasons he used parables, so that people would have to revisit it and think it through and dig in to find the truth for themselves. So now we've had a look at what parables are. We'll come back to the, the story here. Kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. Then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now, right now, I want to, us to go on a treasure hunt around this building there are gold coins nothing outside the doors nothing up here by drums but hidden around this building there are gold coins what I want you to do is go and find them now if you're a little person and you see one of these up high somewhere and you can't reach it Neville man with the bow tie he's the man he's long enough tall enough he'll reach it for you if you see it I want you to each person find one, and when you found it, go. Ready, set, <laughs> on your marks, get set, go find your gold. Okay. What's it like if you were on a real treasure hunt? If that coin was real gold... Can you imagine how exciting it must be to find treasure? Not many people get to find treasure. This guy here in England some years ago, he was out the back of a pub and he had a metal detector and he waved his metal detector around and it beeped and he found a major stash of coins that dated back to the Roman era. And in 2012, this was the biggest hoard of coins ever found in the UK huge number of coins that date right back to the Iron Age. Those people must have been so excited when they found that treasure, wouldn't they? Or they've been probably for years using their metal detector trying to find the treasure and then one day it goes beep beep and they dig down and bingo you've got treasure. So exciting. Why do people bury treasure in the ground in those days. Well, there's a good reason for that. They didn't have banks in those days. There was no safe place. If you had a lot of money that was yours, where could you put it? You couldn't put it under your bed because there were probably 15 people sharing a little house with you. Everybody would have known where it was. So if you wanted to keep it safe, you'd take it out into a field and you'd dig a hole and you'd bury it. You knew where it was. Nobody else did. But then one day you died. <laughs> and the treasure stayed there and some of these treasures stayed there for hundreds and hundreds of years before somebody else found it there was no security there was poverty and there were very powerful people and if they found that money it was gone so Jesus uses the idea of finding treasure to describe the kingdom of God People listening to Jesus tell that very short story would have an instant understanding. Yep, we've heard about that. People bury money in the field, they hide it, that's their bank. They would know that the man was probably a hired servant and uh, that he had no right to it. In those days, if you found treasure, it wasn't, wasn't yours. You know, today it's finders keepers. <laughs> Not then. If you found treasure in a field in those days, if you took it, that was theft. That treasure belonged to the landowner. And if you were a worker working on the farm and you digging the soil and you found it, that belonged to your boss. So it was never yours to take. So the only way to get that treasure was to quickly hide it again and find a way to buy the whole field. If this man who found the treasure had been dishonourable, 
He could have just taken it right then and run and hope that he never got caught. But in this story, we're talking about the honourable way, the, the right way, the honest way to enter the kingdom of heaven. He went away and he sold everything he owned to buy that field. Now, I don't know what the man owned. He might have owned a couple of donkeys, I don't know, a camel. He might have had a smaller field, but he sold everything he owned. Why? Because he knew that that field had treasure in it. But the parable is not a description about property law and who owns what. The message is that the kingdom of heaven is worth trading everything for, everything you own, in order to possess the kingdom of God. It's not something you can just, oh, take it or leave it. If it's that precious, you sell everything you own. The man didn't want the piece of dirt. We could have a look. He didn't, he didn't buy it for that bit of dirt there. He didn't want that tree. He didn't want those stones there when he bought it, did he? He bought the whole field full of dirt. Just He bought it for that little bit there where he knew the treasure was. And if we, So it's about us, this, a parable about us. What are we prepared to do to enter the kingdom of God? But also you can take a step back and say, well, what has God done? about the kingdom of God. It's a picture of what God has done to redeem his creation. When God, through Jesus, secured our place in his kingdom, he knew he was buying treasure that he was after. He also knew there was a lot of dirt when Jesus died. He died for everyone. He died for the treasure, but he died for an awful lot of dirt as well. God knows our humanity, he knows our weakness, and he loves us anyway. I love the verse in Psalm 103, for he knows we are but dust and that our days are few and brief like grass, like flowers, blown by the wind and gone forever. God knows we are dust. We are nothing much, but he loves us anyway. Oh, that's the one there, yeah. The larger idea of the parable is that any sacrifice is worth belonging to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus told a string of parables that day. The pearl of great price, the lost son, a whole bunch of lost coin. All of those tie together to say that the kingdom of God is something you must pursue. It's not something that just happens. And a number of these parables that Jesus told in Matthew 13 are based around fields, the sower, the seeds, weeds, mustard seed. And in the parable of the weeds, Jesus even said that the field is the world. And most of us, or some of us, might have even driven past a field coming to church this morning. A field is quite unremarkable until you look into it. There are things growing, things dying, Bugs living in there. The field is alive. Seeds growing, weeds growing. Fields are ordinary, but extraordinary as well. The kingdom of heaven is planted in the world. The field is often referred to by Jesus as the world. What starts small, like a wheat seed, a mustard seed, a small pot of coins, grows into a big thing compared with the field in which they're found. So the field in these parables is much like the world, the place in which we live. It's all around us. It's quite a normal place. There's nothing terribly unusual, but special things happen in fields. Extraordinary things happen in very ordinary places. And again, as Leslie was saying, small things. God is involved in the little things Sometimes we think God is only involved in the miracles, the miraculous, and we look for the miracles. Well, the chapter before this, Jesus was doing miracles. He was healing people. He was setting people free. Why did he switch from that to talking about the field and ordinary, everyday things? I think because he knew that miracles wasn't enough. (laughs) Even though we think gosh, if only this person saw a miracle in front of their eyes, it would change their whole life, 
Jesus knew that you could do miracle after miracle after miracle and it wouldn't actually necessarily change the heart of the people observing it. And this is what often happens. So he switched from miracles to ordinary everyday things like the parables that he was talking about. Ultimately, the emphasis in the parable is not on the willingness to give up everything and anything for the kingdom of heaven. It is how valuable it is and that we do it joyfully. I don't think Jesus used the words in his joy in that little parable by accident. The man in his joy sold everything. Those three words, he could have left those out. The man went and sold everything and bought the field. No, in his joy he gave up everything else just to get that one treasure, that one prize. Think of the rich young ruler. What did he give up? He came to Jesus and said, what do I have to do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said, well, these are the basic commandments. You have to follow those. Yes, I've done that. What else? He said, well, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. The young man went away sad. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He found no joy in giving up what was his so that he could enter the kingdom of heaven. So what is the kingdom of God? Well, to have a kingdom, you've got to have a king. And a king has subjects. If Jesus rules and reigns in our lives... We're part of the kingdom of God. Who reigns over your life? What reigns over our lives? Or who? Whatever or whoever reigns over our lives, that's whose kingdom we live in. Because of this, the kingdom of God is a kingdom that costs you everything, but nothing. (laughs) It costs you everything. You're completely changed, altered from the inside out. It costs you nothing. The price has been paid because Jesus has already done that. We'll just skip through those. But it's talking again about the ordinary, everyday part of what Jesus is sharing through the parables. God is found in the ordinary. Gaining the kingdom doesn't cost us anything. Why? Why? Because Jesus has done everything necessary for us to be in the kingdom. Receiving the kingdom costs us everything. (laughs) That's the catch. That's the hard bit, isn't it? Gaining the kingdom doesn't cost us anything because Jesus has done all that is necessary. Receiving the kingdom costs us everything. That's with joy we hand over and say, it's not mine, it's yours. And it's a happy trade-off. Everything we've ever longed for is to be found in the kingdom of heaven, the rule and reign of God in our lives. In his joy, the man goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Just being on earth is no guarantee that we're in the kingdom of heaven. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they stepped outside God's care and into Satan's destructive realm. Their eyes became dull. Their communication with God was broken. They began to experience shame and ultimately death. At creation, they walked with God in the cool of the day. After the fall, they were banished from the garden. From that moment on, the kingdom was veiled to our eyes. It became hard to see the glory of God due to the darkness of sin. Now, sin isn't just bad stuff we do. The word sin in Greek is a term used in archery. And if you think of the target for archery, there's a bullseye. Sin, use that word as you've missed the target. You've missed the target. It's not a matter of sin. Oh, I did this wrong yesterday. I did that. You've missed the target. That's what sin is, missing the target. And the target is that Jesus is central to our lives. And he rules over us and we're in his kingdom because of it. So when Jesus started speaking in parables, repeatedly he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so often 
I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. Maybe I'm like you. Maybe you're better at hearing. Maybe you're better at learning. I'm a slow learner often. But uh, we are all too often hard of hearing spiritually. And we need to have our antenna up, have our eyes open, our ears open, and most of all, our heart open to understand what God is saying to us through some very, very simple everyday parables. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the simplicity of the parables that you shared. Thank you that it was ordinary people who could understand, if they chose to, what it was you were talking about. And thank you that thousands of years later we can read the same parables, the same stories, and dig in and find the meaning and the truth of those as well. Thank you that they're here for us today. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to have ears that are open, eyes that are open, and a heart that is open to hear what you're saying and then respond so that we can live as your servants in your kingdom with you reigning and ruling over our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.